Yes, thanks. Um, Guy, my name is Alistair Fussell. I'm the manager of uh, Steel Construction New Zealand. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, we're actually an industry association. We represent people who are obviously involved with steel construction. Um, thanks, Di, for the opportunity to be involved today. Uh, we're going to. Oh, I just realised this thing isn't going to um, put itself up on its own. We've uh, played around with a uh, developed a, a steel concept that we think is going to be appropriate for uh, for Christchurch. Um, and we'd like to just present that to you. Uh, as Di mentioned, this is going to be a bit of a tag team effort. Uh, I'm going to lead off, I'm going to do the easy parts, and when I get to the really technical parts, I'm going to hand you over to Sean Glettel, who's a smart engineer from Oricon. Uh, we're going to uh, present a building that has uh, damage avoidance technology in it, uh, and we're going to do it for the uh, Valentino restaurant site. Now those of you who know that site or that building will know that we've cheated that this building isn't actually going to um, fit on that site. Uh, in the wake of all the economic devastation of the, after the, the Christchurch earthquakes, uh, one of your uh, local developers in, insightfully observed uh, that we just can't afford in New Zealand to build throwaway cities. Uh, which is essentially what we've seen a lot happen in Christchurch. We've seen nearly 1,400 buildings uh, 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 that have uh, been mar earmarked to be demolished. Uh, and so what we need to do, we need to have, a, in order to have a vision for a, a new city, uh, we need to consider new materials, new technologies, perhaps materials that haven't been used so much in the city. And I think steel fits into that category. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of steel, uh, multi-level steel construction in, in uh, Christchurch. Uh, nationally, it's probably about 50% market share for steel. Uh, it's fair to say we've struggled with uh, market share in Christchurch. I think that may change after the earthquake. But we do have some notable uh, examples, and you'll see these buildings here. They wouldn't comply with your new uh, planning requirements. We have here the 12 story HSBC tower building, that's a, a steel building. Uh, that building was uh, assessed after the uh, multiple earthquakes. It was past fit for reoccupation in July uh, this year and uh, I believe it's got Sarah and the city councillor in that building. Uh, the Pacific Tower building, that's uh, 22 storeys. Uh, that building's only been up for probably since about 2010. That building there has, apart from it, suffered uh, damage to one of the yielding elements in the structure. It's being repaired at the moment and it should be reoccupied within a few months. So steel buildings uh, have proved to be uh, very resilient structures. Uh, since those buildings were designed about five years ago, uh, seismic design technology in, in steel and, and many other materials as well have moved on and, and Sean's going to be talking about some of that new technology and his, uh, when he gets to, to do his presentation. I'm just going to quickly introduce you to our concept building, uh, then I'll hand you over to Sean who's going to, uh, we're the head of the geotechnical engineer and the, the structural engineer. And then I'm just going to talk at the end uh, some of the commercial considerations around steel <coughs> construction uh, and also environmental considerations. As I mentioned before, uh, this is uh, our concept building. It's actually a little bit bigger than the Valentino restaurant site. Uh, we actually had already been working on this, doing some uh, studies on this recently. And so we decided that uh, when we saw this opportunity that we would uh, tweak the foundations and we would put a new seismic resisting system uh, into this building for this particular um, workshop. Uh, down here it's about 70 metres long, this building by 18 metres wide. Uh, and this, just to give you an idea of scale, the columns in this um, building are at about, uh, the, the beam span 10 metres here and, and uh, 9 metres in that direction. And really with a steel building what you're looking at is just a grillage of, of steel beams. Uh, they're supported by steel columns. And over the top of the grillage of beams they lay a, a metal deck and then they pour the concrete over it and uh, the metal deck essentially acts as a, a permanent formwork so you don't need to, often you never need to prop it, uh, you pour the concrete in then it acts compositely with the concrete and it greatly increases the, the strengths of the beams, you'll notice uh, on there there's a cross section of the beams, they stick studs on them so that the, the concrete acts compositely so you end up with a very strong uh, lightweight structure and this type of structure here is significantly lighter than the traditional uh, heavy concrete structures that you might see in Christchurch. I'll now hand you over to uh, Sean, who's going to perhaps uh, talk to you about some of the, the smart engineering in it. Thanks, I'm, Sean. I'm going to try. <laughs> Look, uh, thanks, everybody. Um, obviously, you've endured mm. a, lot of, um, a lot of jargon, a lot of um, acronyms, and a, and a lot of information to absorb. I've got a lot more, so I'm going to try and cut it down to some mm. stuff that you know I think you're going to benefit from. Um, a lot of the sort of 
dialogue that you can see on the screen is things that have been discussed in the media. Um, traditional engineers have focused on life safety, not, not about building safety. And we introduced this concept of ductility which lets our structures stretch and grow in, in a dependable mechanism. Now that's been around since the 70s. And on the, on the main, that, that system's worked pretty well. But unlike, unfortunately, it's meant that you know, a large portion of those more, more modern buildings have been needed to be demolished. Um, and obviously the building owner's perception is I didn't expect my building to be demolished. And, and that's fair enough. And as a society, I don't think that we can um, go on like that. And there's a number of us that have sort of acti actively pursuing this change towards high resilience, um, sort of high value, but with limited extra um, capital input. So that, that's the key. It's got to be uh, cost effective. So a bit of background, we've done some very large um, base isolated concrete buildings. Um, we've done this uh, timber, which you've heard a lot about. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about structural steel systems. That's st steel beams and sticks with concrete floor systems. So we've seen the, the image um, very briefly, and that's just an interpretation of how the, the city could evolve. I mean, you could wrap a very attractive, curv curvaceous facade around it, but uh, essentially underneath it, what we're talking about is a relatively regular and very simple structure. Whatever we do, though, in terms of redeveloping Christchurch, it's got to meet the market needs. That's you people. And, and really, that's about safety, certainty, egress, um, flexible use of space, not too expensive to run and maintain, and, and have a, a smart yet not too expensive facade system, because uh, you know, that's where a lot of the capital costs can, can be realised. So it's about setting a scene for the technology and, and making um, Christchurch a creative and innovative place for us to all be. So zoning in on the, the precinct itself, um, it could really transfer itself into residential, office or retail. Um, and these are some of the structural design parameters that we consider. So a normal office building or a normal residential apartment building would be importance category two, where your hospitals might be four, your theatres, they might be a three. So that just sets the threshold or the size of the earthquake the engineer needs to consider. I'm going to take um, Dom's head over here. This is Dominic, he's our geotech engineer. And um, I've just, he's provided me a lot of this background. So if you have technical questions, I'll, I'm going to have to defer you to Dom. Um, but he's sort of constructed this. We've looked at the Peterborough Village area in, in a precinct sort of view. And this is generally what you can see from a geotechnical perspective. A real mix in that top layer, and there's some deep seated liquefaction potential um, down there around the 12 metre mark. In terms of potential building foundations and solutions, uh, we've looked at raft, and others have looked at board foundations, and they tend to be cost prohibitive for those structures that are six storeys or less. <coughs> we've also looked at ground improvement um, and, and other ways of treating and stiffening the soil layers, particularly the peat layer that's uh, present on a lot of the sites. In terms of the actual geotechnical solutions, the key is really just about being um, relatively lightweight, so that's steel or timber, preferably, and that minimises the foundation loads that the um, foundations obviously have to support. So it could be um, reinforced concrete or ground improvement, like a one metre deep crust with a concrete raft over the top. Um, I guess when it gets into piles, it gets a little bit more complex and that, that when big seismic loads come into play, those piles get called into action and you can get deep seated liquefaction creating some issues, but um, still if they're taken to the rickett and gravels then that can be a competent system. It uh, doesn't really matter what we do, I think we've got a plan for resilience. So that means understanding what the earthquake is going to do to our building and a greater st to a greater extent than we have before. So in terms of uh, scale of cost and, and, and known technologies, obviously on the right, the, the deeper system, um, right down into the non-liquefiable and probably the most appropriate for the pr precinct in the middle here, obviously with no ground protection here um, with residential houses <coughs> historically. So drilling again down into the sort of what we believe could be a solution, obviously this is just very generic, very high level sort of stuff for, the, for Peterborough Village. Um, but a, an improved raft on an improved gravel layer um, could provide a good cost effective solution to getting your businesses back up and running. So when it comes to recovery, what we're actually saying is um, some of these issues are, are inherent. There's no panacea solution, but um, I think with good planning, we can prepare. And so simple things like casting plastic sleeves right through the foundations to the bottom and then capping them off 
could provide a simple way of resin grouting and raising the building, mm. particularly these lighter two to four storey buildings. We should be able to raise them and re-level them if there's a good competent gravel underneath to jack off with the resin. So it's about planning for damage. And we've got some Ralph foundations underway at the moment. And these are two, super, well, it's the same supermarket site. Um, is it Kaipoi or? Island. Island, Island New World. Island New World, currently under construction. Finished now. Finished now, I'm told. With uh, <laughs> <laughs> a different amount of data. So this is how fast technology moves. Um, but it's a raft, raft construction is my main point, I guess. So drilling in on this very unsexy uh, structural steel frame, I guess the, the point about it is it's highly resilient. It's very regular, so we know how it's going to behave, but it's very resilient. And so with a metal tray on steel, um, steel beams, with a bit of concrete on the top, these buildings in, in, in Christchurch have all performed pretty well. They've been twisted and warped, and a lot of them are still in service. So that's testament to the kind of technology. And what we've done is we've taken it to another place. We've said, well, can we do it another way and add a bit more um, clevers in there from some of the research that's going on at Canterbury and some of the research that we've done on our projects. And um, we, we've suggested, why don't we do this? So these are just simply the locations of the bracing frame. So you can see it breaks up the floor nicely. And again, on either side, but it's not everywhere. These regular forms enable the architect to put timber or vertical or glass. So there's lots of opportunities. But really, lots of, lots of acronyms. This just stands for moment resisting frame, which is those beams and columns we saw. This protects the frame from damage, effectively letting the base of the column rock locally, dissipating the seismic energy here. And over here, where the beam joins the column, it pivots, dissipating the, so the seismic energy. So we can have lots of ener energy dissipation without any damage, relatively, in our steel frame. If we ever need to replace anything, it'll just be one or two <coughs> bolts. Here it is in practice. The photo on your right is uh, one of my projects from Wellington. <coughs> and we can see it here on a raft foundation, pretty much exactly as it's going to could occur here. And in the other direction, these are just concentrically braced frames, or CBFs as engineers call them. All it means is there's no real bending, and the force goes from, from <coughs> inertial force, because the ground shakes, the building tries to catch up, and then it trusses its way down to the ground. What we're doing here, though, is we're dissipating the seismic energy with a sliding friction joint. So all this is, is some plates and a very high um, abrasion resistant metal in the middle. And we, as engineers, torque the bolts up to a, a very known position and predetermine when we want the building to react to the earthquake. So we're taking control here, whereas previously the buildings have just done their sort of natural behavior in terms of responding to the earthquake. Adding a couple of springs helps us restore the frame to true and we, you're back in business. I guess I've kind of overlooked the issue of building services, which obviously inherently have to be in that protected gravel layer under the raft. And then there's no guarantee that we're not going to get some settlement underneath that gravel raft and we're going to have to bring it back up to level. But I guess with all these bolts at that level, we can always shim the steel frame and recast or re-skim the floor at ground level um, or re-level the whole foundation if required. So I'll skip past this because it's just sort of a bit of, uh, I guess it's really credit actually to be honest to our colleagues at the University of Canterbury and Auckland who have sort of come up with some of this research. These are just the sliding plates and those braced frames. Again, they dissipate the seismic energy. And I guess finally, the benefits of steel from an engineer's point of view, it gives us a lot of certainty. The material is very predictable, it's very low wastage, so what you pay for you know ends up on your building on the site. So I'd like to hand back to Alistair to talk about sort of the cost side of it, and he'll wrap up quite briefly. I promise. Thank you. Because he's telling me something there. Yeah. Um, really, we, we've had some costings done on this. I don't really want to go into the details because probably aren't going to mean a lot to you. But really, just what I'd like to say is that you might think, oh, geez, it's going to cost me an arm and a leg to use this new uh, resilient uh, seismic resisting technology that we've just been talking about here. Uh, rule of thumb is that you'll generally pay between 1% to 2% of your uh, total uh, structure cost is in terms of a premium you'll pay. So it's not really a significant cost. Uh, Sean was involved in this Tapuni Village job in Wellington. Uh, that job worked at about half a percent. So you're not talking uh, huge amounts of additional cost for something that's potentially going to give you uh, a lot of payback in terms of if you had a major earthquake. Uh, steel construction, one of the uh, other features of it is it generates a very fast form of construction. 
Uh, those of you who perhaps played with Meccano when you were younger, that's pretty much what steel construction is. Uh, modern steel construction is actually, there's no, pretty much no welding done on site anymore. It's all prefabricated in a workshop, comes to site on the back of a truck. Pretty much craned in position, bolted together very quick. Uh, rule of thumb, generally if you're comparing it to a concrete structure, probably 10 to 15% uh, faster in terms of speed. Uh, we've done, got Mainzeal builders have done case uh, construction studies for us. Um, and one of the things that tends to get overlooked a bit when people are evaluating projects, you know, generally they look at you know, straight cost of, of buildings. Uh, it is actually, construction time is actually worth quite a bit of money. Uh, if you think in terms of you get your building finished sooner, you get uh, earlier rental, uh, additional rental income. Uh, the developer generally is financing the whole project through the bank with bridging finance, so you pay, uh, it reduce your interest costs. We just did some quick numbers on this building. It, um, uh, based on some figures that uh, Collies International developed. For a building such as this one, about 5,000 square metres, uh, using the current rates for Christchurch, you'd be talking about $43,000 a week in rent, so that's certainly worth having uh, if you can finish a few weeks earlier. And the developer's probably paying about $13,500 a week in interest. <coughs> so we did some uh, cost studies on that, and you'll see down the figures down the bottom. Uh, if you can save um, eight weeks, which you would on the steel structure compared to a concrete one, you could be talking about um, 400 odd thousand dollars of uh, value from being finished a little quicker. Well, one of the common threads which has run through all the uh, Christchurch rebuild uh, conversations has been sustainability. And uh, steel construction has a good story to tell in this regard. Uh, steel con uh, structural steel is uh, a highly recycled material. Uh, structural, well, steel of any sort has a, a, a very high scrap value. Um, you don't uh, ever see uh, steel or any metal products going to landfill. It all has a, a value. Uh, but you know, one of the things you may not be aware of is that uh, people not only uh, recycle uh, steel, but they actually are starting to reuse it in building construction these days. Uh, a notable example was the, the aquatic um, stadium at the Sydney Olympics. Uh, once it was no longer required, the stadium, they pretty much pulled it apart, put it on a truck, took it down the coast, and put it back together again at, um, for the Wynn Stadium at Wollongong, so they could just uh, completely remove it. One thing that's happening in, in Canada is there's actually a, a reuse steel market that's starting to develop now, so instead of uh, demolition contractors coming into steel buildings and just trashing the place and getting scrap metal out of it, they're now actually deconstructing the building, harvesting the steel out of it, uh, grading it, sorting it, and it's now being sold uh, as, a, as a complete commodity. They don't need to take any more energy to uh, recycle it and convert it to new steel products. When it comes to sustainability, uh, one of the interesting things that they did some research at University of Canterbury on the environmental impacts of, of uh, building construction, and what they found was that generally uh, most of the materials, when you actually consider the whole of life, the amount of energy it takes to, to make the materials, uh, the, the operating life of the structure, in this case it was 60 years, and then the energy at the end of the life you've got to get rid of or recycle uh, the materials, that there's not a, real, a lot of difference. But what they did find was that about uh, over 70% of the uh, global warming potential from uh, the, over the life of the building actually is wrapped up uh, in the heating, ventilation, the operational uh, side of the building. And so if you really want to make a difference in terms of sustainability, you want to be looking at uh, figuring out how you can reduce your operation, uh, operational costs. And one of the things that you can do, which is Perhaps you wouldn't intuitively think of this with even lightweight construction such as our um, uh, steel composite um, building, uh, is that you can take advantage of, of thermal mass. And you're probably aware of that. You might have been in some uh, concrete buildings where it's quite hot outside and you go inside and it seems a lot um, cooler. And essentially what happens with uh, thermal mass, as long as you expose your ceilings, if you've got a, a, a concrete slab, either you expose it or you use a perforated metal ceiling, as long as, the, the, in a sense, the hot air can get exposed to the, the underside of the slab, the slab will act as a, as a heat sink, and essentially what it does is it absorbs the, the heat. And you'll see over here, this is the, uh, this plot over here, the grey colour here is showing the, the, the temperature um, outside, or showing the, the temperature if you didn't have a thermal mass. This temperature here showing is the red line, essentially shows that um, effect of, of the thermal mass of uh, acting as a heat sink, and essentially what it does is it tempers out the, the temperature variation, and it also uh, ch pushes or delays the onset of the, the peak temperatures. So instead of perhaps early afternoon, you're cooking uh, straight after lunch, it really pushes it out to the end of the day, so it's the cleaners get the hottest part of the day. 
Uh, interesting thing overseas they've found is that uh, really the optimum amount of, of concrete uh, for thermal mass is actually only 100 millimetres thick. So you don't actually need really thick, chunky uh, concrete slabs, which is really good news when we're thinking about places like um, Christchurch where you don't want to have lots of mass. That's a problem for your foundations or for your seismic loads as well. And just showing you some um, what's happening overseas. Uh, people have taken uh, thermal mass a step further rather than just passive uh, thermal mass where you rely upon the, the you actually, what you can do is you can actually put pipes, water pipes through your slabs. You, you might have done that already with some of your um, on-grade slabs where you actually can use uh, or either hot water or cooling water through the slab just to help improve the efficiency of, of the thermal mass effect. And that's uh, really the, the presentation for steel. Me again. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, um, I just wanted to say whether there was actually um, going to be some sort of independent costing comparisons between these systems because I don't know, I'm not absolutely convinced at some of the, that pie chart that you had comparing timber, steel, and concrete. Yeah. Um, and I, well, we had, we've had um, Mainzeal do the cost studies. We had Oricon, who are consulting engineers, do it. Um, we've actually engaged um, uh, Peter Eagleton from um, uh, pro project, Capital Projects, used to be with Rawlins. And so he's done cost comparisons on this building, and, and pretty much the, the costs are. are Pretty much similar across all of them. Um, the speeds, like I said, we've had Mainzeal, who are a reputable builder, do the cost studies on these jobs. So we didn't um, do the studies ourselves. Yeah, I just think sometimes with those things, you just take out the bits. I mean, I, 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 I do sympathise with you guys because you're a bit like sort of cigarette manufacturers and the PR companies for, you know, <laughs> in terms of, no, sorry, in terms of just sustainability, that, that steel and concrete aren't. <coughs> Um, don't perform well in terms of sustainability. Well, what, we're, well, what we're saying though is that you look at the numbers, I mean the, the numbers were done at, at Canterbury University, they looked at the operating life of the structure over 60 years, so I mean mm -hmm. if, you, if you only look at embodied energy, which is what you're probably alluding to perhaps with uh, people look at the embodied energy, which some think that's great, but I mean you've got to look at the whole life of the structure, the operating energy <coughs> and all of those sorts of things, so we're saying it's just a very simplistic thing, we're saying if you look at the whole life of it, there was less than 10% difference in terms of global warming potential, that was done, it was a math sponsored research. We didn't pay for it. We didn't set up the, the, the research that was done. I'm just quoting the figures that were there. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very curious about the idea of, of building um, structures that are not going to be destroyed by earthquakes, that, the, that you're looking for longevity. You're talking about design parameters for 50 years mm. or cost of a, a building over 60 years. That still sounds like a throwaway building to me. I can answer that. I mean, those numbers are um, what our building code and acts, and as engineers, that's what we're required to design to. That's what we. That's the yardstick by which we have to present our design, and that, and that's the minimum life, not the expected life. So, the in-service life might be a lot longer, and that depends on maintenance and care and a whole bunch of other things. So, I guess that's what the industry expects us to do now. Um, and, and what we provide. So, I guess the biggest thing with steel and uh, being a builder, um, everyone thinks of steel, oh, how the heck are we going to fire rate it? And yeah. um, compared with a timber building, you know, can you answer that? Oh, look, um, steel buildings, I mean, they're, I mean they're, they're well researched in terms of fire performance. I mean, there's a perception that uh, you heat up a bit of steel and it, you know, it, the thing falls down. And that's if you do fire tests on an isolated piece of steel, you get to about 600 degrees and it'll start failing. Uh, interestingly, that whole understanding, though, uh, when you put into a whole structure, when you've got slabs and you've got a whole lot of redundancy, uh, they've done tests in the UK on full-scale fire tests on, on buildings where they've had unprotected steel and it performs infinitely, well, not infinitely, it performs a lot better than bare steel. And so there's very modern methods. And in fact, the, the thing that really twigged that, that steel buildings were a lot more resilient than people realised was that in 1991 there was a fire broke out and it was about a 15-storey building. Uh, it was a steel building. They hadn't put any fire protection on the building. They hadn't put any sprinklers on it. Uh, a fire broke out in that building and the temperatures got up to over 1,000 degrees in that, on that floor. That building was reinstated within about a month. It didn't collapse, uh, and what they realised is a lot of reserve strength uh, in, a, in a real structure as opposed to just putting a small component into a little fire to sell and, and, um, and heating it. 
So there are, there are methods around now, very reliable methods for, for assessing it. Yes, you do have to protect um, the, some of the elements. You don't go into it and put no fire protection. You don't have to fire protect all of them. Uh, there are methods around. There's intermessent paints. There's board encasements and, and other type approaches as well that you can use that, that are dependable methods for fire protection.